Father, thank you that you are faithful. Lord God, we want to thank you that every person here, their destiny, destiny in you is so assured, Lord God. We want to thank you that every person here is, de is destined for great things. Lord God, I just want to prophesy that over every heart. Lord God, I ask that as we share around the word today, that you would open up our understanding, that you would reveal to us more of you, Lord. I pray that every one of us would leave here more in love with you, more understanding of your ways, more able to walk in the calling that you have given us, Lord God, more fully ourselves and more fully in love with you. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Well, we are on our series on Colossians. Hasn't it been great? Today we're going to be talking about Christ is king over everything. And the, the book of Colossians really was Paul's message to a church that was being deceived by all kinds of various philosophies and traditions. And he was trying to tell them that Christ is enough, that Christ is supreme, that Christ is glorious, that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the glorious one in whom who is meant to have in everything supremacy. You know, Jesus, being God, is first in everything. Over all of the spirit realm, over all of creation, he is the king because he created it. But in addition to that, he came to earth as a man. And he won over every sickness, disease, and death. And as a result, he's not only king as God, he's king as man. I want you to understand this. He won as God and he won as man. That he defeated every power of the enemy. And he stands supreme over all of creation, but over all of mankind's issues. He stands supreme. The, the creator and the victor. You can trust him. You can love him. You can give your life for him. Because really, he is as good as he says he is. Last week, we, we talked about from Colossians 3. I'm sure you remember it. We talked about the fact that since we have been raised with him, we set our hearts on things above, where Christ is seated in heavenly places. We, we set our minds on heavenly things because our life is hidden with him. And when he appears in glory, we will appear with him also. And we learned that we had to find a new normal. We had, to, we had to look at our life and expect something different. We had to step out of a past sense of what was normal, and we had to, we had to engage with a God normal for our lives. Yeah. And we, we had to settle for nothing less than that God normal. We learned that we had to reach up and gain and think about and live in heaven realities, heavenly realities, that those had to become our earthly realities. And we learned that we should avoid, step away from, push aside anything that obstructs our view of Christ. And in so doing, in seeing him as he is, we become who we are and who we are meant to be. After Paul has finished writing that spectacular piece, he goes on and he lists a whole lot of instructions for us. He tells us then in Colossians 3, he says, clothe yourselves with compassion. He says, bear with each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Put on love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the word dwell in you richly. And he says, in light of these truths, live like this. And then he goes on and he gives instructions to wives, to husbands, to fathers, to children, to slaves, and to masters. So if you fit into any one of those categories, this book is for you and this letter is for you. And go, go, I'm not going to go through all of those, but go ahead and read them. But what he's saying is for every kind of person, there is a way of living that appropriates heavenly truths and brings heaven to earth, that makes life filled with satisfaction, with joy, with the victories that were won on the cross. 
right after he's spoken about this, he writes this portion of scripture in Colossians 4, and this is where we're going to spend our time. So that was all an introduction so that you all kind of have got an idea of where Colossians is going, where the letter is going, and where we're at in the letter. He says this to the Colossians, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may, pro we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I just feel like sitting in that for a moment. In fact, I do feel the Spirit of God just, just brooding over us. And I, I feel like I, I want to speak to every heart before I continue that, that no matter where you've come from, no matter what your week was like, no matter what your day w was like, there is a future for you that is glorious. I feel like there's some people that right now, you need to hear this. That there is a future ahead of you that is filled with victory, that is filled with strength, that is filled with life. I feel specifically there's someone here that you've even been thinking about committing suicide and I just want to speak to you right now and say this, there is a future for you that is so worth it. It is so worth it. And what you are going through right now cannot compare with the glory on the other side. I hear him saying he's reaching into your heart and he's speaking truth to you now. That will set you free. Right now he is invading your mind with the realities of heaven. And I hear him saying this, do not be afraid, my son. Do not be afraid, my daughter. For though things seem hopeless now, there is a future. There is a future. And it's better than you think. It's better than you imagine. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. On that sober note, <laughs> let's continue here. It says there, devote yourselves to prayer. And that literally means put aside everything. Avoid certain things. Diminish certain things so that you can do that. That prayer is always the right option. I set aside time in the morning to pray every morning. It, they're not always very formal prayers. They don't always follow a list. Sometimes they're just me lying on the floor and crying out for mercy. Sometimes I'm praying for my family. Sometimes I'm just thanking him for things that have happened. Sometimes I'm just chatting with him. But I set aside that time every morning. But then I also try to live a life devoted to prayer. And what that means is that I'm sitting across the table from someone and I'm having coffee with them and they suddenly tell me about this life circumstance that's terrible. And I just go, Lord Jesus, I just pray right now that you would come and rescue this person from the situation, that you would come and bring deliverance, that you would, you would heal their, their father, whatever the particular thing is. Why? Because I'm convinced of this, that my wisdom is not as good as God's power. And that in every situation, I am able to bring down the power of heaven to bear on this situation. That I am not alone. That we are not alone. That there is actually victory through the cross. And at every moment, I can appropriate that. And the way I do it is by praying. The way I do it is, is by declaring what he's already done over that situation. What I do is, uh, the way I do it is by standing in heavenly places with him, seeing his solution, and then declaring it right there in that place. So some people think me strange, but I pray out loud for things in the moment all the time. I was sitting in a waiting room yesterday, waiting for an appointment. A woman sat next to me and started telling me about her daughter who was in hospital. And, you know, I didn't know her from a bar of soap, but in my heart I thought there's only one solution for this problem, and that's Jesus. And right there I said, I don't know what you think about God, but would you mind if I prayed for your daughter? I think she thought I would go into the bathroom or I'd go somewhere else. I don't know what she quite thought. But right there and then I grabbed her hand and I said, in Jesus' name, I just declare health and healing over this girl. And I prayed out loud. And I know that there were other people listening. But you know what? I worried about that five years ago. <laughs> but now I just don't care. You know, I'm just like, I really, 
I'm sick and tired of um, sickness and disease and destruction in my world. I, I'm no longer ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm absolutely convinced that he is the solution to everything. And I'm absolutely convinced that I can access him at any moment. And what that person needs is Jesus. Amen. Being watchful and thankful, he's talking about looking to a good future, but also basing it on the, the stream of good things that God has done for you. In other words, I'm not praying, oh, Lord God, I'm so weak, I'm so bad, it's so terrible. <laughs> I'm praying, God, thank you that you, you've healed me, you've saved me, you, you helped me pass that exam. Thank you that I was able to get that shirt for a really good discount. Yes, I do pray these things. And, Lord, I thank you for that. You know, my, my children are all serving you. Lord, I thank you that, I don't know, I just list everything I can think. And then off the back of that, all those victories, then I can look to a future and say, if he's done all those things, he's not going to change now. What I love about Paul, <laughs> what I love about Paul <laughs> is that he tells us to f devote ourselves to prayer, but then he goes on and he says, and pray for me too. And you know what? If, if I were... Like may, maybe 10 years ago, if I had asked people to pray for me and they wanted to know what to pray, I would ask them things, please, would you pray that I get a new car? Would you pray that, you know, um, I get an increase at work? Can you pray that I get that new pair of shoes? You know, I w I w all the things I was praying for would like, like, Lord, make me comfortable, make it easy. But now if you ask me to pray for you, I'm like, I'm like I'm, I, I don't know, I feel like I just met Paul or I just, you know, I met Jesus and he introduced me to Paul. It's like, no, 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 pray that I am bold in my declaration of Jesus. Pray that at every opportunity I'm willing to share him. Pray at, at, that, that I step out of all that nonsense of being timid and afraid and thinking that I'm not good enough. I just, I'm just don't want it anymore. Just pray for a boldness and a life and a, a presence of God on me that I would be able to share Jesus on every opportunity. Pray that I get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Pray that my life makes a difference because when I go to be with him, that there must be tens of thousands of people that are in the kingdom because I was obedient. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And then he goes on and he says this. It's almost like he says, the thing that I'm asking you to pray for me, I also want you to have it. I want you to almost be an answer to some of my prayers. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. In other words, he's saying, look around you. There are open doors, people crying out for answers. Be ready with those answers. Go out and make a difference. So we're going to talk about Missional prayer today. Yay. We're going to talk about salty wisdom today. <laughs> Some years back, Andrew and I were planting a church in Vintook. You know, it was those old Nam days. You know, the, all the soldiers, soldiers used to talk about when they were in Nam, meaning Vietnam. So we talk about our t time in Nam, you know, when there's great warfare and we, yeah, yeah, it felt like, it felt like a, 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 a war in those days. But we were there in Vintook and I had suddenly, I, I don't know, I just rediscovered prayer and, um, you know, God was just speaking to me about how effective prayer is. And I was sitting in my, in my place where I used to pray and I s my neighbor came to mind. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to pray for my neighbor? No angel arrived. I didn't hear voices um, audibly in my environment. Just some thoughts came to mind. So I began to pray that. I began, and I felt like God was showing me some, some things that were very important to this person that were keeping them away from Jesus. And I began to pray, pray against those things and saying, Lord, would those become small in his life? And would, these, would you, the need for you, become big in his life? And I was praying various things for him, feeling like I was following the Spirit in praying for those. And in my heart, I saw this man saved. I get up and leave the room, 
And Andrew comes into the house like all excited. He's like, you never, never, never guess what happened. So I'm like, no, no, I probably won't. Why don't you just tell me? And so he says he w- he'd been to the shops and he'd got out of the car and he was walking into our house in Vintook. There are no walls between houses. They're just those little chain link fences. And he said, as he was walking to the front door, our neighbor came out of his house and called to him. Hey, Andrew, 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 come here. I need to talk to you. So Andrew went over to, him, uh, over to him and over this little chain link fence, he said to him, I've been thinking about this. What does it mean to be baptized? Can you tell me, Pastor? And right there and then, Andrew shared Jesus with him, led him to the Lord, and because he was Afrikaans, directed him to an Afrikaans friend of ours where he could be baptized. All this time, I'm in the little prayer closet declaring those things. (laughs) I mean, I came, when Andrew told me, I was like, Let's just go pray. Let's just go pray. You know, it's like, this thing works. This thing works. God is interested in saving the world. He's interested in transforming your environments. He's interested in your neighbors, in your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your children, your parents. He's interested that every one of them would know him. And right now, I bet you even thoughts are coming to your mind of things you can pray for those people. Jesus made three spectacular statements. Spectacular. He said in John 14, 13 to 14, he said, ask anything in my name and I will do it. He said it twice. Can I just say that again? Ask anything in my name and I will do it. Just think of that for a moment. This is Jesus Christ talking. Not your dad or your sugar daddy or whoever. This is... This is This is Jesus himself. He will do what he says. Ask anything in my name and I will do it. I know this person who discovered a store where you can go and buy fake name brand labels. You can buy Nike. Adidas, Guess, I mean, you, you name the Calvin Klein. You can just go and buy the actual labels. Wow. So what he does is he, f- he, he, goes, he goes to the cheapest store he can find and buys the cheapest clothes that he likes, brings them home, and sews on the labels. <laughs> he does. <laughs> he, he has... He has these Adidas shoes, well, Adidas shoes, you know what I'm saying, Adidas shoes, that after like two rounds around the garden just fell apart. (laughs) He's got Nike shirts that after one wash changed color and are four sizes smaller. (laughs) And I just wonder this. I don't know who the CEO of Nike is, but if if he found this person wearing like a half orange, half red kind of um, shriveled shirt with Nike written on it, how would he feel? He'd be like, you know what? You might have put my name on there, but that's not my shirt. That's not my shirt. Get that name off that shirt because you are destroying my reputation right now. And you know, I know many Christians that pray, Lord, would you smite my enemies? Would you destroy that person who looked at me funny? Would you give me everything I want in Jesus' name? (laughs) And you know what that is? That's like a shriveled Nike shirt with Nike on it, like in Jesus' name printed on it. You know what? When Jesus said, ask anything in my name, what did he mean? He didn't mean just tack this little line on the end. He meant, find out what I want, pray it, and you'll get it. He said, find out what I am longing for, pray it, and you will get it. Find out what I'm doing on the earth today, pray it, and you'll get it. Find out what my values and my belief system is. Find out what I want, pray it, and you will have it. Jesus, 
then went on and said this, if you believe and don't doubt, you will speak to this mountain and you won't throw it into the sea. It says, you will speak to this mountain and it will throw itself into the sea. You know, it gives me a beautiful picture of you just walking to obstacles and believing that God wants you to go through and the obstacle going, ah! Just get out of here. Where can I go? Let's jump in the sea. Get out of her way fast. And you all understand that there used to be this really ugly mountain in Joburg. You understand that it had its top cut off. Do you know about it? It used to be right in the middle of Joburg. We hated it. And so it was like an obstacle to the glory of God in our city. So we walked up and we said, get out of here. And it threw itself into the sea in Cape Town. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, I, so I know it works. I know it works. But then he said something else spectacular. spectacular. He said, if two of you ask anything, it will be done by my Father in heaven. If two of you agree and ask for anything, it will be done by my Father in heaven. Think about that for a moment. Parents, have you ever been in a car with three toddlers in the back? Or two, or one, no, not one, three or two or five or however many in the back. And one of them, Mommy, Mommy, I want the window open. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> then the next one, Mommy, Mommy, I want the window closed. <laughs> yes, so you close the window. <laughs> I want the window open. No, I want the window closed. Mommy, Mommy, the wind's blowing my hair. I don't like it. Mommy, Mommy, I want to hear. I want the wind in my face. You know, it's just like this tug of war between two of your children. What do you do? <laughs> Finally, you just like, forget this. Nobody's getting what they want. Yeah, you open, yeah, you open it half and say, live with it. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. You understand what I'm talking about? But I, if they all just conferred on the back seat and said, what should we ask mom for? Okay, we, you want the window open, I want to close. Let's ask her for it, open in, for an hour and then close for an hour. And if one of them said, hey, mom, can we have the w window open for an hour and close for an hour? And they all agreed, you know, <sighs> done. <laughs> you know, even if they all ask mom, mom, we all think that we would want, we want an ice cream. You know, it's probably be done too. <laughs> because you're just the piece of the agreement. <laughs> just have whatever you want. I don't think God's going to give us what's bad for us just because we agree. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But what I do know is that God so values unity. He talks it, about it in Psalms, how where there is unity, there is a commanded blessing. In other words, where we agree and where we're thinking the same way and where we're seeking God together and when we're asking Him for the same things, He actually, there's like a booming voice coming out of heaven and saying, there will be blessing. Paul shows us exactly what he was meaning by this missional prayer that would take over the world. He said, earlier on in Colossians 1, he said, All over the world the gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. And everyone said, Amen. Oh my word, this is what he was praying for these people. Because you know what? Paul had seen a vision of a world transformed by a conquering Christ. He had seen a world where children grew up in happy families, where life was filled with blessing and grace, where sickness was abolished, where uh, everything was in its right place. He had seen a world like this. 
And at the same time, he knew that the way that this world was going to become to reality was through you and me reaching out to the people around us. You and me taking control of our environments and saying, this in this place, Jesus will reign. In this place, his truths will be. In this place, I will establish his rule and reign over my life and the people around me. He, he saw people reaching out to their neighbors and, and transferring the glory and the grace that they'd come to know into their lives. He saw people speaking into broken lives and saying, no, that's not good enough. I'm reaching for that new normal, which is Jesus Christ. And I'm saying, this devastation I see in your home cannot be here. And therefore, I'm going to come in and I'm going to walk with you and we're going to talk through these things and we're going to learn new things and we're going to learn to walk a new way together. Yeah. Let's talk about salty wisdom. I went to a friend's house last week, Sunday, me and my family. And she, honestly, she served this. It was the most profound thing, I went out and immediately bought all the ingredients to make it myself. She saw, served us strawberries with a little bit of lemon juice and uh, icing sugar on it. That sounds great. The last ingredient was salt. Now, you're thinking, who put salt on strawberries? Well, she did. And I want to tell you, these were the most heavenly strawberries I've ever eaten. You know, you, you bit into them, and it was like beautiful, sweet, strawberry, oozy, gooey, lovely taste. And then this bang of salt just hit you in the roof of the mouth. Ah, now I'm awake. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was like an experience, an adventure. It was like all these tastes together that just really thrilled you. Really thrilled you. And when I was thinking about this, I thought, imagine life without salt. Imagine a meal without salt. I went to the doctor a while back, and he told me I had low blood pressure, and he said to me, eat as much salt as you want, and I took him at his word. <laughs> I mean, I just, I'm not one of those people, like, just a little bit, I mean, I put salt on my food, and I'm telling you, I just love it. I'm sorry if you've got high blood pr pressure, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, you know, food without salt is just, it's just a duty, you just do it because you have to do it. You understand what I mean? Have you, have, you ever, have you ever been to someone's house and they serve you food and then halfway through it, they say, oh, I forgot to put the salt in you. You go, yep, I know that. <laughs> but you know what? It's just, it's, just, it's just awful. It's bland, nonsense stuff. On the other hand, have you ever... Have you ever, I, I've done this before, where, because I do put salt in my food, even when I'm cooking. So there have been times when I've dished up the food and then I've had a, a plate and I'm eating it and I take a mouthful and I realize that the, the salty stock cube I put in or whatever the amount of salt I put in all stayed in one place <laughs> and it's now in my mouth. <laughs> Have you ever had that? Yeah. I mean, it's just like, cannot stand this, I cannot, you know, it's like, get me to the bathroom, if there was no one around, I goes right back on my plate, sorry, <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it's just gross, it's just really gross, and, you know, it gives us, it gives us an understanding of what Paul was talking about here, and he was referring to a statement that Jesus made that we are the salt of the earth. All of us clumped together in one place is a little bit too much. Yeah. You know, you, know you, can, you can give the world a, do a dose of Christianity that just makes them go, Pah. you know, it's just, ah, it's like self-righteous, it's filled with condemnation, it's just, you know, you must do this, get your life right, you're not right with God, you're a bad person, blah. Or you can give the world. You can come into the bland, tasteless duty of what they just have to get through on a daily basis. And you can, your life can be that, you know, they bite into that strawberry and it's good. But then, zam, there you are with the words they need and the, the life they need. And suddenly it's like, oh, wow, could life be like that? 
And Paul says we are to look for every opportunity to share this kind of life with just the seasoning, the spice, the joy of who Christ is. Yeah. And I want to challenge you today to think even right now of three or four people that you can be the salt to, that you can bring the wisdom and the, the grace and the blessings of your life to them. Believe it or not, you have answers Because you are hidden with Christ in God. And and we know that in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, says Colossians. You have answers you don't even know about. I promise you, you put yourself out there. You take a chance to interface with people who have problems. And I'm telling you, solutions will come to you that you had never thought of. John 4, 35 to 38, Jesus has just spoken to a Samaritan woman at a well. She's an outcast of society. The people are shocked that he would even speak to her. It's a beautiful story, which I'm not going to go into, but he he basically ends up bringing her to him, and she brings the whole town. The disciples are away looking for food at that time, and he makes that spectacular statement is that he says I have food to eat that you don't know of my food is to do the will of the father and to complete the mission that he has sent me for and then he makes another statement that is so great he says this to his disciples he says do not say four months and then the harvest lift up your eyes And see now that the harvest is white. In other words, it's ready. What he was saying is, you guys didn't even see the Samaritan woman. Because she didn't look like the person you expected to come into the kingdom. And yet, because I had my eyes lifted up, expecting a harvest, I could around me see her readiness. I could see her heart, and I was able to step into that void and say something. I promise you this, that the Spirit of the living God is already at work in the lives of the people around you. I promise you that. How many years before you gave your life to Christ were you starting to feel conviction or unhappiness or just like something's not right? It was a long time. And I guarantee you, everyone around you, the spirit of the living God is reaching into their hearts, is giving them an idea that there's something more than they have right now, that there's got to be more. And it manifests all kinds of irritations and frustrations. But lift up your eyes. The harvest around you is white and it's ready. And if you listen to the voice of the Spirit of the living God, He will let you into the secrets of what He's doing in those people's lives. And it won't be like difficult, hard things. Just words will come to mind. Just a thought to invite them, to call them, to send them a message, to tell them that their child is going to be okay, to ask them what's going on, to say, can I pray for you? It will be simple, easy, but wise and incredible words that will bring them one step closer with every interaction. I love how Paul described how he experienced this. How he was able to to recognize the spirit at work in other people's lives. And how he was able to co-labor with him and follow him. He said it like this. We proclaim him, admonishing him and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Listen to this. To this end I labor, struggling with all this energy which so powerfully works in me. That word for energy literally means spirit-empowered energy. It's only ever used with the spirit working. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't labor for riches. I don't labor for my personal comfort. 
everything inside of me is laboring, working, to stay united to God, to hear his voice, to follow him, so that I may work with him to bring about the salvation and the maturity of the people around me. And you say, I'm not Paul. <laughs> That's not my purpose. <laughs> I would beg to differ. I feel like that the commission to bring the knowledge of Jesus Christ into this world is our job. It's the church's glory. It's our privilege. And I promise you it will be the greatest joy that you have ever experienced. How many of you, if you were absolutely certain the next person you shared Jesus with would accept him, you would do it? Yeah. I'm telling you, the only reason we don't do it is because we're afraid. And here's my thing. He said, our future is already secure, guys. Let them chop you into a million pieces and throw it into the sea. You're still victorious. God's still taking care of things. He will watch over you, your families, your life. Because we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God to salvation. There is a dream that God has for this world. And it is so glorious. It's so magnificent. It's worth giving your life for. It's worth giving your life for. It's worth being counted as one of his followers. It's worth whis risking ridicule. It's worth risking shame. It's worth risking everything. Yeah. Because he's worth it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So in conclusion, your missional prayer and salty wisdom are part of God's plan to bring the revelation of Christ to all the world. Because Christ is the king of everything. Amen. Let's pray. Can we just give him a hand just because he's good? Can we do that? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You really are the king of everything. Lord, we want to pray. Father God, we want to right now just dedicate our lives for the king of everything to be made manifest in our lives, Lord God. Father God, we don't want to be timid and afraid anymore, Lord. Lord, I want to ask. I'm going to ask for a bold and brash thing. Lord, I pray for every person here <laughs> that they would not be afraid again. Lord God, I pray that when that fear stalks their heart, you would rise up in power. You would rise up with the revelation of your presence with them. You would rise up with the security of who they are in you. You would rise up with the revelation of a good future that is already assured for them. Lord God, I pray that you would counteract those lies with the power of your spirit, Lord God. I pray right now with Paul that you would open up doors for us, Lord God, that in our environments we would find ourselves face to face with people who are asking questions already, that you would lead us to people whose hearts you have prepared. Lord God, I ask right now that every person here would have the joy of bringing their friends to Jesus, of bringing their neighbors to Jesus, of bringing the people around them to Jesus. Lord God, because you're worth it. Lord Jesus, we see your dream for the world. We see the transformation of our neighborhoods. We see our homes filled with joy and life. We see sickness and disease vanquished. We see. We see what you see. And Lord, we're asking that you grace us to bring that. That you grace us to bring that. I feel like right now, the Holy Spirit wants to come and fill you with a fresh blast of his presence, his joy, his power. And where you are, I'm not even going to ask you to stand. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands to receive something from him thank you Lord Lord God Lord God we want you we want your power and we want your ability Lord God with Paul we want to labor in things that mean something we want to be labor for things that are valuable that are eternal we want our lives to count beyond the 70, 80, 90 years we live here, Lord. We want our lives to mean something. And right now, Holy Spirit, would you come and fill us with more of your presence, Lord God. Lord, I pray you destroy 
the lies of the enemy that are keeping us thinking small, keeping us living small, Lord. We want to be radical, on fire, in love, wise, tender, merciful, joyful people. Come and do that in us, Lord. Thank you, Father. Come and do that in us, Lord. And Lord, I pray for every person that is associated with anyone here who does not know you. And I ask that you would give them words, actions, and truth, boldness to bring those people to you. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Can we give the Lord